What what what, the, what does this this sea call thing do? What does it look like when it goes off? Um, where does it go? How does it get there? When it arrives, once it arrives, uh, you know, what am I meant to yeah. do with it? Um, so, it, yes, that, that's that's absolutely fine. We can do that, and we'll we'll fix a date in the diary for the next um, webinar, uh, and I'll make it a, a proper video webinar this time. Um, Thank you. But obviously, I've got to make it clear to everybody that it, it's not exclusive. Anybody can come along and do this. It happens that so happens that, that riders may have been the first to ask. So, yes, that will be. Thank you very much for the offer. That will form part of the um, the next uh, webinar once we fix a date for it. So, oh, Garrett's in as well. Hi, Garrett. How are you doing? Hello, Andy. I'm doing fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, are you still out? Yeah. Uh are you still okay for next Tuesday? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I got everything booked, and I look forward to it as hell. <laughs> Brilliant. Okie dokie. Um, I, I was just saying, we've just had a, an offer from David, who's also on the call, for the next webinar. Did you hear that conversation or not about um, what we would do for the I webinar? heard the last two minutes. Of okay. <clears throat> So basically what we're proposing to do for the next webinar, not this one, the next one, is um, David um, has an IVS which is coupled to a PSAP. Um, so one of the questions that I'm getting asked almost on a weekly basis now by, by member states is, hey, uh, this e-call thing, what does it look like? once it goes off you know when it arrives in the PSAP well you know what are we meant to do with it so um, I've accepted David David's offer although made it clear that if any other IVS supplier comes along and says hey we, we've got one as well um, then that's fine we'll we'll do and we'll run another one because there'll be plenty of people asking that question and, and I'll make sure that Norwegians are <clears throat> are also present because they are really, really struggling with the e-call at the moment. Um, so what I was um, saying uh, just before you joined, uh, Garrett, is that today um, I'm going to run through some of the presentations that we had yesterday. Um, uh, we had a, a major event in Brussels called Making E-Call Happen, which was a, um, a workshop. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to run through some of these. I'll just pick the ones out that I, I think are, are, are interesting to everybody. Um, uh, and then, then we'll try and spark some debate off that and then, then fix um, another webinar, um, hopefully next month or, or sort of between months. I'm, I'm not sure of the date yet. Um, so whilst we've been talking, I see we've had just, I think it's just been you that's joined, Garrett. So we've got um, David Garrett. Uh, Marin, uh, Mikhail, and Shadi. So uh, those are the runners and riders we have at the moment. So um, what I'm going to do first is, um, hello, is I will um, look. What I'm going to show you is <clears throat> in the morning there were basically three presentations which I believe would be of interest to the audience. We've got one about e-call volumes which came from the Czech Fire Service. Um, I want to talk about this one here. This is from an organization called Eucaris, this one. Um, and the, uh, actually I might run the two together, the equal upgrade process as well. Um, both of those were from Jan. And then uh, this one about MSD. So it's, it's all about the minimum set of data and sharing it across the rescue chain. And then the last one I'll deal with um, is this one here, which is um, actually, no, it's not that one. It's the afternoon one. It's a little bit about certification um, because there's, there's a lot of concern among, amongst um, for AI Hero partners as well as other member states over what this is going to happen, what will happen and what this means um, and how we do it. So um, anybody else got anything to say before I launch? Uh, into just just basically showing and uh, running you through these um, presentations. Right. Okay. Let's just run these first and just see. Right. 
Okay, so this this presentation here, this one, filtering uh, volumes and false equal. Um, I'll run through these. I have to say that some of the the views expressed here are not necessarily the ones of I Hero. These are ones of of Jan Colonel Jan Urbanek um, and the Ministry of the Interior for the Czech Republic. Um, some of the things he suggests he does, I wouldn't do personally. But anyway, um, so what he wants to talk about is he's talking about if you have to, to achieve an equal upgrade, these are the resources that he thinks you're going to need. And to start off with, he uh, his initial viewpoint is that for a public safety answering point, there is no need to change the number of inbound lines. So lines, telephone lines coming into the PSAP, you don't need to change because he, um, his rationale is that the there is a transference of call, not an increase in call, which may or may not be true. But what we do know already is that if you are going to be able to receive e-call, you need an e-call modem. So an in, you need an in-band modem at the PSAP end. Now, what we do know is that the traditionally these devices when they're first manufactured have a very limited number of lines coming in uh, and we found this during hero one and hero two um, where we had automated um, e-call dialers working that a lot of the calls were falling through because there were only two or three lines available for actual e-calls going into the modem so if your line was engaged, that call disappeared into the ether. You couldn't take it. So what you have to be absolutely sure of is that um, you've got the right number of lines calculated, and it'll come in the next presentation, calculated to ensure that you can field every possible e-call and parallel calls. Now, a parallel call, um, in the UK, we used to gauge that if you get a, a 999, a 112 call. So you get an incident. You've got lots of people looking at it. They've all got their mobile phones, and they're all hitting 112 at the same time. In the UK, if you get about 100 plus calls about one event, you know you've actually got something quite significant. But how do you handle 100 calls? So you've either got to put them on hold. Um, or you've got to try and deal with them. Um, this is uh, also where you talk about um, PSAP capacity, and this happened in America. For the latest riots that took place in, in Baltimore in America, um, fully staffed PSAP, and they were working flat out, and every time they looked at their, co their call list, there were 25 calls waiting. No matter what they did, there was always 25 calls later waiting. What they didn't realize is that there were only a maximum of 25 calls that could possibly wait. So they never, ever got to the end of the queue until they changed the parameters. And then they could actually see that rather than 25 calls waiting, there are actually 5,000 calls waiting. Um, so it's technically it's something you need to be aware of. And then... For the call takers, they need training. Now, iHero has that documentation. We can provide that. But they need to know the noises and the significance of the noises that will come associated with an e-call, what the information that's presented in front of you is, the level of confidence that you can, you can assign to it. So in essence, that's really what, in the very highest level, somebody says, I need to set up a PSAP. This is what you need. Um, Again, coming back to, to, to what I was talking about for the modem, you need an in-band modem at the PSAP. There has to be redundancy of, of, of service. So it's got to be more than one of them, because if the, if the only modem you got is broken, you don't get any e-calls. Um, and then you've got to have multi-channel capability or queuing. So it's one or the other. Um, and you need to make a decision, will you only process e-calls? So those that have the e-call discriminator, and real calls, or do you handle all the test calls as well in that member state? So the test call will be forming part of hopefully the periodic test inspection for for um, vehicles. Now you could be it could be as simple as the mechanic seeing that big red button and going push. Yep, okay, that works. Now do you want to be handling those calls with a highly trained operator, 
or do you want to be dealing with recall, real calls? You have to make that decision. Um, I'll skate through this, but basically the call takers, if you train them, you've got to use them. It's no good having a highly trained, highly tuned call taker that's ready to deal with e-call and then you don't use them because that defeats the object. And you must use the e-call flag to ensure that the e-call, as it comes through and into your PSAP system, goes to the right station. Um, right, here we go. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting. In Czech Republic, they realize, of course, that after the, the 31st of March 2018, it's applied to all new cars. The expectation in the Czech Republic for aftermarket is not expected to be huge. I disagree with him, uh, and you'll, you'll see why in a minute, because <clears throat> he's actually done some stats on this. And he's asked the question, do new cars crash very often? So, here you go. Eddie, uh, this is Garrett. I had a question. Yeah. C can I ask now? Or you yeah, yeah, go on, go on, go on, please. Um, is it a Czech special law? Because it's, it's actually new type approvals after 31st yeah. March 2018. That's the EU um, law. Yeah, no, he... So he not made, every new car. No, no, it's all new types of car that will, will come on the market. Uh, and he did okay. pre... Precede that or um, um, put a caveat in front um, by saying he, that he didn't believe that many of the vehicle manufacturers would be um, selling new types of car after the 31st of March, certainly not initially, um, that it would be confined to the older, an older car. So whilst it's new, it's still an old model, so it doesn't need to fall within the, um, the call requirements. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Super. Um, so, what uh, Jan did is he he went to basically this presidium of the Czech Republic, the police presidium. So it's the police college for the Czech Republic. These are 2016 figures, and if you go from zero on the left to the right, these are the age of the vehicle involved in a collision in the Czech Republic only. OK, so you can see when you've got a brand new shiny car, you tend to take care of it so you don't get too many crashes. However, you go into the begin, the end of the first year of purchase and you've actually owned the car for one year. You can see it spikes. That's the highest um, in the Czech Republic, the highest rate of collisions. OK, so you get about 12. So it's just over 10,000 collisions per per year okay for that year um, and then it, it drops away drops away drops away until you get to 20 years plus um, and then it starts to rise up again and of course at 20 years plus um, in fact it's well anything within that um, whole graph now they are non e-call equipped vehicles so you're not going to get the benefit of e-call there okay then he then went on using the same data or well, same data source, the implementation timeline. Now, this is only dealing with e-call based on 112. So this is looking at the, the car park for the Czech Republic. How many new cars do you buy and how long do you think it'll take for, for the implementation to actually take effect? Um, and so you can see um, it, it, it's a quite a, a defined curve with a bit of a spike at the end. So there's not going to be too many cars out there for the first, um, certainly the first two years are not going to cause too much of a problem. That's their view. I have to say I've looked at some other member states, certainly in the, in the way that they've looked at it in terms of their, um, their purchase of new vehicles. Now, of course, if you take into account the strategy of some of the vehicle makers who won't issue a new type of vehicle so it, it has to be equipped with equal based on 112 this this could be about right okay um, so what he's he's working on is that he his calculation for the Czech Republic is that he needs one piece app probably one position maybe two and another back another piece app for backup no more that's all he requires um, because they they service a about 5,000 calls a day in the Czech Republic. So not that many. Uh, so he, he's, he's quite content with that. So 
Um, that's actually quite, that's one of the first times I've actually seen this done in, in terms of eCall based on 112. What it doesn't take into account is the strategy of the OEMs uh, in terms of um, the, the uh, development of new types of vehicle. What it also doesn't take into account is just like Garrett from General Motors, Garrett's vehicles now are equipped with, with third-party eCall, so the OnStar service, is that will continue, I, I, take, I take it, Garrett, yeah? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so what, whilst this in the raw looks quite okay, what you're missing is the elephant in the room, which nobody talks about, which is the third party service e-call, which if, as, as Garrett, to use Garrett's words, you bet, they're going to be sending as many of these cars with the OnStar system equipped. Um, and that will have a significant um, impact on how the PSAPs, uh, what level of PSAP response is required. Another point that was made at this particular point in this presentation is, it is anticipated that there is no reason why a vehicle manufacturer cannot issue an, an e-call equipped vehicle after the 1st of October next year. Because, in theory, every public safety answering point should be unless you're in the UK, of course, should be primed and ready to go. They should be ready. So commercially, um, I, I would see certainly um, Garrett and the rest of, the, of the, the vehicle makers trying their level best to get private e-call um, into the marketplace and the public safety answering points need to be in a position to answer and respond to these calls. And I'll come back to that because there's a whole data aspect behind that. So um, he then went on to talk a bit about false calls. Um, already, the, the, the specter of false calls is is known. It, it, it happens. Every single PSAP suffers from false calls, whether they're malicious or accidental, but with a good intent. Um, so what you have to factor into this is, is how you're going to manage false e-calls. Um, which um, could create a problem uh, if it's a machine, a remote vehicle activation, um, which is false, because that does create a problem. Um, or even if it's a private um, e-call that's, that's activating, certainly until you've actually, the, the, the receiving uh, service center has worked out that it is a problem, you're going to have to deal with these calls in the first instance. Okay. Um, there was... Uh, a lot of discussion about cross-border cases, and this is an issue particularly for countries like the Czech Republic who are smack in the middle of Europe, and they have to be able to deal with every single one of their neighbors and to be able to move um, a PSAP, uh, not a PSAP, an e-call activation, and a log that is created from an e-call activation to another member state or another region. So it, it's very important for them, okay? Um, and these are the, I'll put them all up. These are the events that they wanted to talk about. So it's a flagged event with data and voice. So it's a regular, a regular e-call, a silent e-call flagged event. Okay, so it, you've got the e-call, you've got the data, but you've got no, no voice. Uh, and then you've got the beginnings of an e-call event where everything is terminated and what you do with those. Now, in those particular instances, the Czech Republic said in every case we'd follow that up and we'd send a resource. Well, I tell you now that in all probability that certainly wouldn't happen in the United Kingdom. And I venture to suggest there are a couple of other member states where it wouldn't happen either. Um, so let's just move on a bit. Um, he was talking about these, uh, the information they're getting behind them for those three events. So you get the 112 caller location, the precise GPS location, additional technical data, um, possibly additional information reported by the car occupant. Um, so they can make a decision that there's, there's really no problem. That's a regular e-call. Question is, where is it? So once you've worked out where it is, it's who gets the, the message. If you have a silent e-call, um, at that point, you then find that the PSAP operator needs to start to earn their money. What can they hear? 
and this is where the training comes in um, is what can they hear what cues are they picking up you know can they hear a, a ticking sound as an engine cools down um, can they hear people in the background um, all sorts of strange noises that if you are a trained PSAP operator you'll recognize if there is a crash or not um, <clears throat> and that point he said depending on what you find then he would send uh, a resource to that and then you've got this uh, where the connection has failed um, then he, he still said he said he would send a resource um, but he'd start search I'm not sure about that one I, I really don't know there's not enough information provided there okay um, but you, you've got to be able to move the data around I will come around to data in a minute because um, it's if anybody thinks that for an e-call the reception of the, and the decoding of the minimum set of data is enough they're wrong badly wrong um, and the, the presentations yesterday really highlighted this in the fact that the reception of the minimum set of data is just the start you've got to be able to encode that into your um, command and control system as a standard log and then to be able to move it around and that's the part a lot of people are forgetting at the moment so let's just look at a manually, manually initiated e-call which is the one that will cause everybody a problem uh, and that's what they would do so they have a decision where it's supported with a voice communication yes we'd go um, a good Samaritan call so the, the, the caller is looking at what's happened he's not involved in it um, and where you get the call drops then PSAP will try and call back if they could see the number of the e-call and this is again a major area that is yet to be defined that for um, e-call based on 112 the, via, the the sim cannot be in a roaming state it must be wherever it is in Europe it must be at home because if it is then the PSAP operator can see the number um, so that's to the end of that particular input has anybody got any questions on that one is that helping or do you not want to do you want to deal with something else okay uh, that's not it right so if I then go and deal with Jan's uh, upgrade okay this is just really at a very high level telling a member state what they need to do and his opening statement was if you are a member state or you are representing a member state and you need to update that e-call and it's today so it was yesterday the 6th of September and you don't know what you're going to do you are too late because you won't get it all done in time and he's probably right uh, and there's certainly at least one member state that I can think of that falls within that category uh, because they don't know what they're going to do they haven't even started um, and they have no technical solutions so it was there was those are the absolute written articles that you need to be to source to be able to achieve an e-call upgrade so as you said here you know uh, if you don't know what to do it's already too late um, so you have to work out how many centers you need what the call volume so that goes back to the previous uh, presentation um, and the modem and you need to talk to your mobile network operators and if you're fortunate where you've got big the big mobile network operators like Vo, Vo, um, Vodafone O2 um, Telefonica O2 or Orange or one of the, the big ones then that's okay because most of those will deal with the equal upgrade for you where you get the smaller uh, mobile network operators um, you do have a problem because many of them won't or can't upgrade um, big question here new or polished now that refers to do you get yourself a brand new PSAP shiny straight out of the box or do you polish the old one until it shines just a bit um, and uh, his view was that there's a there's pros and cons for both but what you mustn't forget is that within the next two to three years um, you will need to upgrade your public safety answering point to be able to um, handle SIP calls so um, 
session initiated protocols. So in effect, telephone calls from the internet. Because if, if you do that, this could be a sticking plaster. You can put a, a server solution in front, but you will need to upgrade your PSAP in the next two to three years as well for SIP calls. Um, what it's talking about here, so it's the minimum set of data is, and it, it's really about the operator. Which information do they really need to know? Um, and how is it presented to the call taker? And this um, also runs into the private e-call side. There are a number of um, private e-call operators who are desperately trying to ensure that uh, they are making available video streaming from a 4G equipped vehicle um, to the public safety answering point. And again, keep it simple. Do you really want to show a public safety answering point operator a video? Actually, the answer is no, you don't. They're not medically qualified. They're not ready to receive it. So the answer is don't do it. Um, so there is there is a place where it should appear. So where you have a triage and you're uh, like in Norway, where you have a medically trained call taker. Yeah, that's the place where you really should be showing the videos or additional telemetry so that they can make a clinical decision, but not as a matter of course. Um, but what Jan says here, simplicity is the key. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, don't overload them with the information. We already know that the PSAP operators are struggling to reconcile a voice call with data because they're just not used to it. It'll come, but they're not used to it at the moment. Um, Jan talks about Eucaris, and I'll come on to Eucaris in a minute. One of the key elements that every public safety answering point needs is the ability to decode the VIN, the vehicle identification number, which is sent in the minimum set of data. High value for the fire and rescue operations. And as Jan said yesterday, if you get this right, it means we have solved the puzzle of how to get into the car before we arrive, which is absolutely critical. Now there are two, in fact, there's, there's three ways that you could achieve this. You can use Eucaris, which is the European Car and Registration Information System. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. You have your own, each member state has its own registration database of vehicles that are registered in that country. And you also have an offline VIN decoder, which is a, um, a commercially available device that will interpret the 17 digit VIN to 17 Garrett, isn't it? I don't know. I think it, I'm fairly certain it's 17 digits, but the VIN decoder will will work it out. It will tell you what it is, where it was made, um, and what originally its fuel type was. And that's one of the big thing, big plays that Eucaris make. But make no mistake, the, the, the public safety answering point has to have that capability. One of the parts that I want to come back to in a bit, if I have sufficient time, is to transfer the, the minimum, minimum set of data. But as it was pointed out a little earlier in, or a little later in the day yesterday, it's not transferring the minimum set of data. It's actually transferring the incident log. Because the first thing the public safety answering point operator does when they receive a call is they open a new log. And what they have to do is take all the data they've got, whether it's from voice or from anything else, put it into this log and then send it somewhere. Well, unless you can decode the minimum set of data and pass it around, you can't do anything. And that includes um, private e-call as well. And this is why it comes really, really important that the, the, the private e-call providers have got to be able to transfer the data um, and do it in a, co in a cohesive way. Um, yeah, big question yesterday is who's going to pay for it. Um, my own personal view uh, is it has to be a combination between the European Union and the member states. Private private eCall has to be paid for the paid for by the private um, eCall provider because the PSAP it should not cost the PSAP anything. It should be cost neutral um, because it's the provision of a contracted service between. Um, the service provider and the user. Okay. Um, public tenders, I'll just touch on this, but if anybody has ever been involved in public tendering, it takes a long, long time. 
Um, and I think a lot of people are underestimating that. Um, certainly in the Our Hero project, we have a number of public tenders which are out now. Um, they were started in um, October last year, and some of them haven't even got to the point of being published effectively yet because they still haven't been written. <clears throat> and it'll take some time to put the RF um, P out and then the RFQ and then an engagement and, and contract award. So it's going to take some time um, and it has to be done correctly. And then once it's done, once the e, once the PSAP has been upgraded, you've got to know that it's right. So what has to take place then is the conformity assessment. And I'll talk about that very briefly again in a minute. OK. Um, and said again, he said it again. Um, if you're not ready by the 30th of September or the 1st of October next year, it's too late. Um, and they're, the Czech Republic are well on track for that. OK. Uh, again, he said he, he reckons Czech Republic and they speak uh, quite frequently to uh, Skoda. So they're part of the VAG group. And they already see or have been told that there is a high probability that there could be equal deployments after the 1st of October next year. So that's that. Any questions on that presentation? I know I'm whistling through these. OK, I'm going to talk just going to touch on this one. This this. Uh, right. OK. Now, this presentation was uh, by uh, from Eucaris, uh, and it was uh, Rolf uh, de Graaf uh, from Eucaris. Eucaris, um, and I'll go into this because it actually explains what Eucaris is. Um, so that's, Uca that's right. Let's just deal with an introduction of what Eucaris is. So it's a European car and driving license information system. This is what they do. They provide a secretary, a support, finance, specifications, and have a general assembly. So they deal. There is legislation in place that allows Eucaris to function. And you can see them there on the left-hand side. And then on the right, this is what they do. There is a messaging course. So basically, it's a messaging system between all, at the moment, 28 member states. Um, but then it, it has a web client. It has tools. And it brokers connections between um, different member states. It has its own secure infrastructure. And it also is heavily involved in testing of this system and its upgrade. Okay, It's um, a any point to any point system. So you can see a picture of what Eucaris looks like. It goes to any registered authority. It doesn't go in a hub. It'll go directly. So again, it's not for profit. Each member state um, and all 28, no, all, there's 27 that belong at the moment. Denmark doesn't belong. They pay about 8,000 euros a year to become part of the club. Um, and then there are other member states who pay slightly more than that because they're funding additional functionality that will eventually go towards the, um, towards every member state. And the current one is all to do with um, the Certificate of Professional Competence, that's CPC, for the operators of heavy goods vehicles. So there's a register. Each country has to maintain one. And what they're doing now is making them available so that the officers on the street can find out if a truck that they stop and is owned by Fred Bloggs, whether Fred is actually someone who is entitled, legally entitled, to operate um, a freight or a logistics company for profit. OK, these are the things they can provide at the moment, vehicle related data and driving license related data for any member state apart from Denmark because they are they're not participating. OK, so it's all these and they've just added and it does move very slowly, slow moving agricultural vehicles. So you've got motorcycles, cars, long distance coaches, heavy goods vehicles and slow moving agricultural vehicles. Um, so this is one of the data exchanges that is new. It can uh, deal with uh, transportation managers reputational check, which is the certificate of professional competence. So there you go. There's a truck flying across and he's he's checking. He's a good guy. He's, he's allowed to operate a truck in it, uh, uh, operation. Um, so here you go. This is what Eucaris will do with your VIN. 
So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I was right. So you've got the 17 characters there, and it tells you what each one of those characters means. And that's um, that particular VIN you saw is broken down, tells you that it's a 2006 Volks, a Volkswagen, um, and what exactly it was by each of those codes. I won't pretend to, to go into that anymore because it's there. All of these presentations will be available online. So VIN decoding, it's standardized. There's two standards, one for the US and one for the EU. They do differ slightly and you can get um, commercially available. In fact, there's even one on the web that you can use that costs you nothing. It'll tell you this is what, right. So here you have a direct comparison between the two. This is what Eucaris will tell you on the left-hand side, but it takes you 10 seconds, or slightly less than 10 seconds. VIN decoding will take less than a second, and this is what it will do, but it also costs you somewhere between 110,000 euros per year to run. Eucaris is free because the, the cost is paid by the member state already. Okay, So here's some... Uh, things that Eucaris will tell you and a VIN decoder won't. That's a Mercedes C-Class. And as you can see, if you look at the back, at the, on the, the bumper at the back behind the rear wheel, there's that little gray and black circular area. That's an LPG filling port. So that vehicle runs on petrol or diesel. But no, it runs on petrol, but also has an LPG tank. Quite important to know if you're a member of the Fire and Rescue Service. OK, so there you go. This is what um, a VIN decoder will tell you on the left and on the right. You can see that it actually tells you exactly that it, tell, it, it, it runs on LPG and or petrol. So it's a dual food vehicle. Now, there you go. Um, that's going to be my next car. Um, I quite like the idea of, of the, um, the TV in the back seat. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I think if that was an original 2CV engine, I don't think it would go very far. Um, but moving on, if you look at that, um, the VIN decoder gives that as a Citroen 2CV with four doors. Uh, in actual fact, Eucaris, you can see that is it correct because they've had to register the change to it, uh, that it's got six doors. So it's it's these little errors, these little levels of detail that Eucaris will give you over a VIN decoder. Nothing wrong with a VIN decoder. It will tell you what you need, some of what you need to know, but it may not be as accurate as you think it would like it to be. OK. Um, right. Uh, this was the first time that Eucaris have actually come and talked to us for quite some time, and they are really becoming very proactive in helping member states, uh, and in particular, public safety answering points, connect to the Eucaris system. Because traditionally, this has been the province of the police service, and the police have been very jealously guarding this because it, they regarded it as a security um, function. But it's not. It's actually available quite legitimately for public safety answering points to provide the information on the vehicles. Um, so his conclusion, I think the code is working. It might be a useful fallback. Eucaris system, um, you can get details of any vehicle in any country in about 10 seconds. So if you're in mainland Europe, not the UK, but mainland Europe, that's actually quite an important feature. Although come to think of it, there are parts of the uh, United Kingdom, particularly over towards Suffolk, where you would need to know um, if it was a Polish equipped vehicle um, and parts of London as well, because there's a lot of Slovenian and Poland ve Polish vehicles running around the UK. So that's its conclusion. Uh, and he's very happy to help. And we now have a very good contact and good friend for Ecol. Um, OK, any questions about Eucaris? Because that hasn't featured much um, in, in many of our conversations, particularly with with member states. Um, it is very important. Um, and we now have following discussions today for the management team meeting. Um, Activity 4 in iHero does have actually a specific um, technical line to liaise with Eucaris. And because the two guys were there to, uh, yesterday, they've now got that activity moving at a far faster pace. Hang on. I'm just, whoops, no, that's not it. Uh, right. Let's just get rid of that. 
Uh, right. Now, uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah, okay. Um, I want to share uh, this one with you. Now, this is all about data. And um, this particular presentation, which was done by Luca Bogonzi from Beta 80. Okay. Um, so the, the problem that eCall faces is eCall is part voice, part data. And to date, the majority of people that are dealing with eCall think, well, if I can get the minimum set of data into the PSAP, that's fine. It's not a problem. Well, actually, it is a problem because no PSAP that I have ever come across just deals with a telephone call. They don't write anything down. They don't type anything into a into a command and control log. It's not dealt with in isolation. So um, every every PSAP will, in some way, shape, or form, have one of these an incident form. Let's call it a call log, incident log has a number of different names, but it all adds up to the same thing. It's a record of what, uh, a written record of what the operator is either hearing, um, is being told, is seeing on the screen. It all goes into a log. Um, usually these logs um, are structured in a way that it asks questions, and certainly some of the, pro the private e-call systems have the same similar setup that if it says, um, I've been involved in a car crash, then if you put its subject lines, car crash, then it'll go, ah, oh, right, you must need to know this, this, and this, and you need to tell this person and this person. So what iHero are looking to do is to use what's called the Common Alerting Protocol, CAP. And what CAP is, is a, a universal open standard that means that if, you, if your call log is CAP compliant, you can send that anywhere in the world, in theory, um, so that another public safety answering point could open it, see it, and see what was going on. And it's also very important for TPSPs as well. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, OK, so interoperability amongst PSAPs, it's, it's not a simple story. It's not like what you see on your screen. So you've got the emergency call, Call a qualification and location, then you just dispatch the rescue services. Okay, it's not like that at all because there are at least five different variants for the PSAP. This is number one, where you dial 112. This is the French model, so you will dial 112 or 101 or 12 or whatever number you want, and it goes to the emergency service that you ask for. So this caused. Um, uh, for anecdotal uh, wave in Paris, this caused huge problems when there was both the Bataclan attack and the Charlie Hebdo attack. In Paris, there are 22, 22 separate numbers to call the emergency services of differing flavors. And at the end of the day, the citizen didn't know which number to call. But if you dial use your mobile phone and you dial one of those numbers or if you dial 112 usually it will go in some cases to the fire service in other cases to the police service and very rarely it'll go direct to a medical service in the second service this is where the first level PSAP filters the calls and passes it to who they think is right that's the UK model and then the third one is they gather more information here um, and they can be on the line for up to 50 seconds. So they, they're getting much more information. So the people at level two, the police, fire, and the ambulance can just dispatch. They don't need to ask any more questions. Um, then you have um, the distributed uh, version where the call goes to one room. And within that room, there are the police, the fire, and the ambulance. OK. Um, and then this is the... Uh, the optimal model, number five, where a PSAP, um, and it could be of any flavor, could be privately run, could be uh, run by the military or whatever, um, receives the call and dispatches um, the emergency service resource as well. Um, that happens a bit in America in some states. 
and parishes and counties um, and there's not too many of these in the United in, in Europe but that's the optimal model um, any questions so far so what I'm going to come on to next and I'll just move through these quite quickly is the concept of an incident form there are always always the same questions in an incident model at the very highest level form so you always have the caller number where the caller is and what type of call it is so if you remember I was just saying I've been involved in a crash so you get the number so it's usually displayed automatically roughly where the caller is and what what's the problem and there are there's a drop down list to pick from and then you have these fields on the right which contain other data okay now the minimum set of data for an e-call falls into um, one two it could do with some automation fall into three because it's it's involving a collision of some sort and then you've got the um, information other which is on the right hand side um, so um, at the moment the MSD is received by PSAP A uh, but it has to be trans transported to PSAP B in uh, the form of an incident form okay it's not the minimum set of data and that's the bit that's being lost at the moment by a lot of people particularly in the UK as well um, this is how they want it to be for to tomorrow so the PSAP opens uh, receives the e-call decodes um, and the minimum set of data automatically populates um, a, an incident form which is CAP compliant and then that incident form is transmitted immediately to PSAP B which will be a dispatching PSAP it's got it all um, it's free it's extendable it's future proofed it's everything the question is why aren't we doing it already because people don't want to talk to each other uh, and then you've got interoperability um, how that would would work so they reckon that if the five models that I showed you um, you would certainly need the, the cap protocol for models one two and three it could work for four but might not be needed and it won't be required in five so um, that's the current thinking about those um, and this is the a recap of the cap structure about how all of these bits of information can fit together um, I won't dwell on that too much what I want to get on to is um, dealing with uh, right TPS equal the difference so um, this is what should happen at the moment so the top diagram you see is pan-european e-call and then it passes through and it, it reaches um, the operator and everything can be seen and the voice can be heard um, in a TPS e-call scenario where there is an electronic transfer of data and there aren't very many of those about at the moment um, you could have um, this particular uh, scenario they're using voice and data being separate um, not a, a combined voice and data in the same channel but the interesting part, part here is the ability to transfer data between the TPSP client and the PSAP and this is one of the things that is can be achieved it's not that difficult the most difficult part that is trying to be achieved at the moment and Garrett will back me up on this I hope is actually trying to find the right PSAP to talk to yeah, yeah. because uh, and it was echoed again yesterday you have to physically go and visit every single PSAP in Europe to find the right number geographically to dial to reach that PSAP. Okay, Shadi, yeah, see you later, mate. Yeah, um, maybe if I should comment um, this with the numbers, I think this we have figured out because we also need to call them already in, in our current business model. And the data transfer is, is, is a challenge because um, 
it is important that we have not for each piece have a different solution. So I yeah. think also with the work we do with Ina, and maybe also with the support of this group here, um, we we hope to get a a solution that will be able to be applied to all PSAPs. Um, we have currently a solution in place with the UK and also with Slovenia who have required this basically so we are even allowed to operate OnStar in these two countries. Um, I don't know exactly now which technical solution it is but it's it will be good. These yeah. two solutions are not too difficult, they work well and if this uh, we can use also to look at and help the standardization um, we would gladly uh, love to do so. Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you, Garrett, for starters, that the UK one, whilst it works, is a bespoke solution, and it bears no reference to what what on earth has gone on in Europe. Um, it, it's it is bespoke. It will have to change. Um, so I don't know what what BT are going to do about that. The Slovenian one, I would hope is probably much closer to this scenario that you've got here. Should be, it should be quite close to this. Um, but in, in terms of this, uh, um, certainly I, I would encourage if you have some, some staff that are able to look at this and are interested in it, that um, a call and a liaison with Luca for activity four, because this is what they're dealing with every single day. This is what they're talking about, and they need to find a solution. Um, one of your, your competitors, Bosch, are there already, and they're talking. But what they're looking for is this, this common protocol, which is free to use. Because, of course, you also need to be – are you aware of this suggestion from Bosch about this provision of a, of a server where every, every TPSP um, – puts their data into that server and then the, the PSAP has to go into the server and pull it out? I think that's the solution they were hoping to get into place for Germany. Yeah. Um, but is. I think they, they, they're not doing it now. They're doing it PSAP by PSAP, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about it, but I don't know the details. Um, well, we, I, have a, I have a presentation I can share with you, but which came from Bosch yesterday. Um, they're still looking at that solution. But they don't know how to implement it because, of course, the, the the issue being, well, okay, that's a really good idea, but who's going to pay for it? Who's going to fund this this um, server that's available to all of the TPSP operators, um, one could say globally, um, and then allow the, um, the PSAPs, um, once they've... Uh, achieved still that they would still have to achieve the call that would still be the same at the moment um, and then they would be given a reference um, to actually go in secure reference to go into the server um, but I, I, I might send you that presentation in a bit but as you as you're right it, it with there's two versions of this or two similar versions of this operating in Europe at the moment uh, and this is what it looks like at the moment. This is, it's, um, as you can see, TPS2, for instance, is having to talk to PSAP1, but it's talking in a different language than it, if it goes to talk to PSAP number two or one, and it can't because each one is a different story, as Garrett, you know, you, you found out. What they want it to look like is this, where you have this TPSP web application internet page where the PSAP gets access and is able to draw down the data. Um, but that's been suggested in 16102, which for some reason not many people seem very keen to use. I don't know why. Um, but it's not standardized. Okay. So uh, what they're, they're asking is look for this, this CAP protocol. Um, uh, and again, the, 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 the TPSP set of data, um, current references use XML uh, and the representation according to 16102, which is the SEND standard for TPS eCall. Um, and this is what they propose using the CAP protocols. You can see um, a lot of the CAP protocol and the MSD all fit together. It will work, but then there are some additional data fields which don't. 
Um, I'm not going to propose to go through that. It's far too much information on that slide. Um, so what they're, they're looking for is to actually go from that to that. So everybody speak in the same language, which at the end of the day, it makes life simpler and cheaper for every stakeholder in this whether they're a TPSP provider or a PSAP, it's cheaper. If everybody's got talking the same language, it makes life a lot simpler. Um, so let's okay. So that that was that particular presentation, which I actually was 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 very good. It was well received, um, and it, it needs to be viewed in conjunction with the the, the Bosch presentation, which came later in the day. Um, so I've been going an hour now. Um, do you want me to continue for a little bit longer or, or, or are you all reaching capacity at the moment? Somebody talk to me. Um, Andy, hi, it's David here. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of reaching capacity, but can I have a couple of those slides? Yeah. Sure. I mean, they're all, yeah, they're all... Right? No, the few things I would like to, especially on the PSAP side, I'd like to get a better understanding from Jan Ubeck's, Ubeck's um, showcase he was doing there. Yep. Uh, there's a few important points in there I'd like to look into myself, really, because as we're so far down the road with, with the IVS, just making sure that um, nothing's being missed or nothing can be added to make it to enhance what's already there yourself. Probably you'd need uh, Luca's presentation as well, I would think. Yeah, that would be good. And Garrett, I'm going to send you, as you can see, I've highlighted it here, yeah. uh, this mm -hmm. one, because... I, I would be interested to in it, actually, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that might help some of the discussions, because you and I have got to have a discussion. I spoke to Kathy two weeks ago. I don't know if she's been in touch with you. Um, yeah, um, about I mean, we, Scotland. As, as we have been. But anyway, I'll see you on Tuesday. I'll, I'll fill you in on that. Um, uh, I won't. I won't bore you with the Andy ones because they were all really quite hypothetical. Um, I, I think I'm going to call a, a halt now because otherwise I could just talk myself into the ground and I won't be able to talk anymore. Um, have I got any? Oh, hang on. I've got a question. Was that Shaddy? That's, right. Okay, um, that was just a glimpse of the type of event that we put on um, and the sort of discussions that we had. Um, we had, I think it was 65 people present yesterday from all over, well, in fact, all over the world, because we had quite a large delegation from Japan and Korea, um, you know, just talking about equal. Um, there are some more events that will come up. There's one on the 27th of October in Cyprus. And not forgetting the e-call days when, I know, Garrett, you're, you're going to be there, aren't you, Garrett? You're at e-call days in Hamburg? Yes, I will be there. Yep. Um, I hope to get a, a car also with OnStar to test and uh, get the, the feeling. But it's not confirmed yet. But we do have a booth also. Cool. Um, but no, no presentation this time. No, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Um, and then we've also got, so we've got Hamburg. And then there will be another master class for e-call on the 3rd and 4th of November in Bucharest. Um, so those are the, the, the major events that are taking place at the moment. Um, so taking in mind um, David's offer uh, for the next uh, associate partner webinar, and I'll run it as a proper webinar this time, and I'll give you control, David. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, we need to look at a, a date when we could possibly do this. Um, so I'm looking. Uh, actually, no, I can't do it then. Uh, Towards the end of October, would be yeah, better that's, for us. Yeah, that's what I yeah. was. I was trying to find. Um, because we're, we've got, just got to finalise with a PSAP integration. So right. Can showcase it correctly. Uh, 25th. Right. How about the 25th of October? 
That's a Tuesday. Failing that, yes. we, we'd have to go into, then we'd, we'd be into um, November, which is in the first week in November is the, the, the iHero conference in Bucharest. Um, Let's do the 25th of October. It's good for me. Okay. Right. Yeah. 20, 25, 10. Me too. Okay, cool. I, I will put that out to everybody. Uh, so make it 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, okay, I'll set that up. Now, um, so I need to know who wants what. Garrett, I'm going to send you the Bosch, uh, mm -hmm. the Bosch presentation. Um, and David, you want? Do you want both of Jan's presentations? So yes, please. Yeah. Okay, Jan times two. Let me just. The other one I need to show you. Um, is the afternoon session because there's another one in here that um, this one and this is all to do with conformity assessment and uh. it, which is quite a hot topic I can, so I can send you that it's not a problem I can just convert it and send it if you'd like it yes, right yes okay. please yeah let's just have a look right Martin G. Right, okie dokie. Um, are there any others there? Anybody else thinks they would like to see? They'll all be on the website hopefully by the end of this week. Um, but has anybody got any burning requests that they want to see or have one made available sooner rather than later? Anybody? Um, Mikael? Oh, no, you would. You were there, weren't you? So you're okay. Yes, I'm. Yes. Uh, uh, Marianne? Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, could you please repeat uh, your question? Are there any of the presentations that I've gone through, that I've talked about today, that you would like to have as soon as you could uh, rather than wait because they, they should be online by the end of this week no it's okay until the end of this week it's okay. cool okay brilliant um, all right then everybody well thank you very much for being a small and select um, band um, for attending the next uh, webinar will be on the 25th of um, October at 2 p.m. The subject covered will be, um, let's give it a topic, David, IVS demonstration. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, and then we can take it from there. Okay, everybody. Um, right, for those of you that are coming to the UK for the eCall event on Tuesday, I will see you all there. Um, I think other than that, um, I will, of course, be available um, right the way through um, and I'll speak to some people hopefully I'll see others in Hamburg um, and possibly some in Cyprus um, and if not I will speak to you all on the 25th of October lovely thank you all very thank much you, for Andy. your participation and um, I will speak to you all soon and have a good uh, remainder of the week thanks very much everybody bye thanks, thanks Andy. Andy. bye 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 see you next Tuesday okay bye <laughs>